you should, Nathan. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining what is now the fifth session in our Global Conversation Series. I can't believe we're almost midway through February. Uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of has changed in the past year, and in many ways, it feels like Groundhog Day all over again. Um, that being said, I'm super excited about today's topic, Oceania, which is the region that encompasses the islands of the Pacific and the lands down under. Joining us today are three of my favorite people in the travel industry, starting with Sarah Farag, Director of Southern Crossings New Zealand, whom I had the pleasure of meeting when I was um, invited to go on this educational uh, trip of a lifetime in 2015. Southern Crossings has more than 30 years experience in designing truly personalized travel for discerning clients, from couples to multi-gen families. She's always on the lookout for incredible under the radar experiences so we can wow you along the way. Uh, Drew, hi Drew. Um, and hi, Sarah. Um, Drew is the founder of The Taylor and a person that I've also been ex extremely fortunate to have traveled with and experienced firsthand the custom itineraries that he and his team um, designed for our clients. Drew's wealth of knowledge in, of his home country and his attention to detail and the love and his love of adventure are what help make Taylor's itineraries incredibly unique and experiential. Ren, hi Ren, uh, is another hi, Kiwi I met in New Zealand in 2015 while he was working for Tourism New Zealand. As an indigenous New Zealander of Maori heritage, his passion for not just New Zealand, but the myriad of cultures of the many island nations of the Pacific is what led Red Ren to found Pacific Storytelling in 2020. Its aim is to provide resources to us and, and to all of you um, who want to learn about how to be more sustainable in our travels, in our travel choices, culturally, socially, and environmentally. So welcome everybody, and let's just dive in. So around the world, I would think we can all agree that New Zealand, as well as Australia, and many of the Pacific Island nations are seen as having managed COVID better than nearly most every other country around the world. Um, of course, this has caused a real complete halt to inbound tourism, which is a major contributor to jobs and economies throughout. I'd be really curious to hear from all of you um, how you've seen partners and all of your own companies adapt to the change in domestic focused tourism? And have there been any lessons um, learned that you think are going to carry over um, when the return of international tourism starts up again, which we all have our fingers crossed is going to be early in 2022? So Sarah, um, maybe you'd want to start off. Oh, sure. Well, thanks, Jolene. This is lovely to be with you all. Um, just to touch on that, because you are absolutely right, we have had relatively good COVID success in our parts of the world. But um, I think the key word there was island nations. And whilst Australia is a continent, it's still uh, separated by a lot of water and a flight to get there. So um, we're not too smug about our result. We just see it as one of the advantages with being able to close a border and protect the citizens. So since March last year, uh, None of us have had international tourism at all, a complete stop, uh, which has been interesting in the world of inbound because everyone selling travel outbound and inbound has turned to the domestic traveler. Uh, what is challenging there is that, especially in New Zealand, New Zealand is a country of DIYers. They do it yourself and they're pretty proud of thinking they know New Zealand exceptionally well. Uh, where we've been able to add value is that we do know it probably a little more intimately than most Kiwis. So we have really focused on taking them just further off the beaten trails and into really unique parts of New Zealand because that's where we can add incredible value. They just don't know about those places. And so we have actually opened a subsidiary company called Explorations, which is taking small group guided tours around some really unique, like really getting into deep fjordland and um, 
the, um, the East Cape of New Zealand or Stewart Island and these places where New Zealanders just actually don't even have the confidence to go to on their own. So that's been an interesting journey and where we would like to continue that for the international traveller is trying to ensure that they can see the value of getting into some of those places that aren't as well known. We've always liked to do that, but we want to take that a step further. It's a huge benefit to rural communities. Yeah, that is, that is true. You know, getting out and exploring some of these lesser known um, spots of, of your country, just like for us as, as well. What about you, Drew? I mean, I think Sarah's hit um, <clears throat> the nail on the head. I mean, I've got some notes here that um, says wilderness and remote is the new lux, right? So, I mean, it's been pretty easy for us to do this because we've always focused on this. This has always been our thing, is to take people far, far off the beaten track. So, but even I have discovered things that I didn't know about, you know, remote islands. Um, I've always known they were there, but I didn't know how to deliver them. So, um, you know, we've put a lot of effort into going and seeing these places and then putting trips together. But there's definitely going to be a flow over into international when it comes back because I think the tastes of the post-COVID traveller will be very, very different. You know, people are wanting to spend less time in cities and they're wanting to go and really explore. And... You know, we're very fortunate, you know, Sarah, Ren and I, that we live in a part of the world that doesn't have a really heavy population. So there is those wild places left, you know, like um, there is places that you can go that literally are unchanged since, you know, white man came to this part of the world. Yeah. And, and, I always like putting, planting that seed in client's head that they don't have to just check the box and do the tied, tried and true. That, you know, not to say that a, a, just a place like Sydney or, or Queenstown or something like that should be missed, but there's other things that we can weave into an itinerary that can make it so unique and different from everything that they see out there on the World Wide Web or hear from their friends and things like that. What what do you what do you think, Ren? What are you seeing and experiencing? Yeah, look, I totally agree with Sarah and Drew on this one. Um, I think we're all taking a look in our own backyard right now, and uh, I think long term tourism will be better for it because our smaller rural communities will start to see the importance of this industry and the power of what travel and tourism can do so long term I think it's going to be a good thing um, you know for tourism as an industry um, moving forward. I will say though um, and echoing both Sarah and Andrew again is that although we are a big geographical area in Oceania we have very little population. We don't have the populations of say uh, North America or Asia uh, so that domestic pool is a lot smaller for us down in that part of the world, which is why the international markets are of such importance. Yeah, well, trust, trust me when I say we're all just crossing our fingers that, you know, things open up towards the end of the year or the beginning of the next, because we have so many clients that are just really wanting to explore these areas for the first time or come back. So, all just right. Just one more point on that, Jolene. Yeah. Is this... And I would really be interested to hear what Ren and Sarah have to say on this point as well. You know, there, there's these places in the remote of Australia, and I'm sure it's the same in the Pacific and New Zealand, that have the most unbelievable experiences. However, people are going to have to accept that they're not going to find Southern Ocean Lodge or Lizard Isle if they are willing to do these experiences, right? Yeah comfortable the food's good obviously the wine's great but um you know i think 
you know, that may be one change that the traveler is going to have to accept. If you want true wilderness, untouched, and really high quality indigenous experiences, you have to be prepared to go outside of your comfort zone. I mean, I don't know what Sarah and Ren think about that comment. Couldn't, I, I personally couldn't agree more. Um, but I think you touched on this, Drew, right at the beginning and saying that the new luxury is in fact where, where you can go to that is, um, it isn't about the thread count and it's not necessarily about the you know, the amenities. Um, I've just been um, last week, in fact, to this beautiful part of the centre of the North Island. You can only get there by helicopter and it is um, Maori Trust land. But the, the iwi there want to focus on allowing people to go into this one little cabin in the middle of nowhere. Um, the bathroom is basic but it doesn't matter at all. The luxury is your location and what they're doing to the land there in a restorative approach. They are trapping the wildlife and you can go with the Department of Conservation to see that and experience it. Um, this is not a money-making venture for them at all. Someone philanthropically built that cabin and um, we've got the um, invitation to allow very few people, but the lucky ones, if you ask me, to go in there and enjoy it. And um, I think that is gonna be part of the reset for the international tourist as well, to enjoy those places. Just like you say, try and lower the expectation because it, if you're going to go to those more familiar places, which are still wonderful and you can dip into them as well, um, but putting some of these places and stretching their minds into going to them, you will come out richer. I'm sure of it. I agree. And there's nothing wrong with mixing it up and sprinkling the simple and the humble with the over the top and the wow, because it, I think it makes you appreciate each of those experiences for what they really are. If you keep going and going and going and the bar just keep, keeps getting set higher and higher, sometimes the shininess and the newness of that really amazing luxury experience you become jaded it's horrible to say but it's kind of true so yeah I, I agree you know it is about setting expectations but I I do think the new traveler and how we focus on what we want out of our our travels and time away is going to be a little bit different so that kind of brings me to the next question um, and we talked a little bit about this already because the pandemic has brought, you know, many new challenges as well as um, new opportunities. And um, I'd love to know maybe what are some of the unique challenges that you've seen in, in your countries and regions that you're um, working in and how have people really risen to, to meet them? Um, maybe you've seen some creative or unique solutions unfold over this past year. And maybe Drew, you, you can, you'd like to start this one. Um, you know, I, I think we've got a unique situation here in Australia where we have the seven states and territories. So the big issue for us has been interstate travel. So if you're traveling from say Sydney to Melbourne or Melbourne to Queensland or Melbourne to South Australia, you're actually crossing state borders. And what's happened in Australia is the premiers one by one, or your equivalent of the governors, right, have closed the borders. Mm. You'd see is that you can't travel from Adelaide to New South Wales, to Sydney, or you can't travel from Adelaide to Darwin, or you can't travel from Adelaide to um Tasmania yeah yeah exactly exactly so you know what we were coming up against we we had some actually really great travel booked um we've been very fortunate that you know we had a, a pretty strong domestic database always just through our own personal connections and so forth and so on so um but the the creative solutions that have come about from the suppliers, the suppliers have been magnificent. You know, you know, it goes back to relationships and this is a key word here, right? People, because it's us, they will, you know, postpone that travel without charge. They will change it. 
In, and in fact, in many cases, they've just refunded it without question, you know, because they value the relationship, right? Because you're and, a partner. You're not just a, you're not a supplier. You're an actual, it's, you're a partnership. It's a partnership. Yeah. And I would say, you know, in the majority of cases, probably 85% plus that, well, you know, probably 90% plus that has been the case. I will say that there's some silly people that uh, haven't taken that relationship as seriously. And, um, but, you know, that, that has been the big thing is that people have been willing to put the client first and do whatever is, um, is uh, required to fulfill the client's enjoyment. In fact, we've had a lot where people said, look, I'm just going to send the money back because we know what everybody's going through. And then we've just been able to book another trip in another state where they could travel. So that's what we've seen a lot is a lot of changing and, you know, um, but I think that's pretty much, um, you know, confined to Australia. So, I mean, I just come back to the fact that, you know, what it's done is it's given me time to refocus, right? You know, and given me time to catch my breath and work out what matters to my company, right? What matters to me, you know, like I really want to give back. You know, that's a really big thing for me is to, you know, regenerative tourism, you know, restore, use places that care about the environment, genuinely care, right? You know, they have tree planting, rewilding, things of that nature, you know, and I'm very fortunate that I have, you know, an undergraduate in this field. So I, I actually understand it. And, you know, I have a lot of people in agriculture that I went to ag, did ag science with. So, you know, it's been very interesting that, um, you know, that there is a real movement, like, oh, I mean, the movement's been around for years, but like, there is a real action, you know, there's action taking place on, you know, the health of the planet that I see anyway. Right, right, which, I mean, that, you've touched upon like half the questions in, in for this discussion, but I think, you know, this time of pause, for me personally, it's, it's brought about so many silver linings that I'm, I'm thankful for on so many ways because it's given me time to do things that I would have never had time to do before because I was always too busy. It was always about, you know, responding to clients and building the itineraries and checking all the boxes to make sure that everything was going perfect and then boom you know following up when they got back and it was just like and you could never stop and now we were forced to stop and it was shocking at first and there was a lot that went on with that process but then it kind of was like well wow I get to kind of start over and rethink how I really want my business to be and look like in the future and the type of travel I want to do and the type of clients I want to work with. And it's, there's been a little bit of joy, I have to say in that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to hear maybe from Sarah and Ren. I mean, Ren, you have, you've really done a pivot and found the silver lining. And I know from talking to Sarah, she's had some time to find some cool projects as well. So I'd love to hear about that. Friend. For sure, for sure. So, uh, yeah, so that dreaded word pivot, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just, 2020. <laughs> honestly, and I'm looking at the screen and I'm just surprised I'm not a cat um, on the Zoom filter. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> uh, We're just about you know, it's just like, where are we today? But no, um, yeah, I've worked in travel and tourism for a my entire career, my family actually were some of the original pioneers of travel and tourism in New Zealand. Um, I come from a little village with a big name uh, in a place called Rotorua and five generations of my family have taken visitors around our backyard, uh, which is filled with geysers, mud pools, hot springs and sulfur. Uh, and so that is my home and uh, I've lived now up in America for the last five years previously with uh, the New Zealand Tourism Board and then most recently with 
an Australian wholesaler. And then everything came to a stop in, uh, in March. And I, st and I thought, well, I've got some time on my hands. I can do the thing I've always wanted to do. Coming from that rich history, um, that's, that's, that's the authentic story of New Zealand. That's the authentic story of the destination. And we need more of those stories. People want to hear that. People want to understand, you know, where they are and who they're visiting and how to be respectful and all of that sort of thing. And so, you know, with that extra time, I started a training and education program, which lives free online. Um, it's fundamentals about how do you respect someone else's culture when you're at their place? Um, you know, what to do when you find yourself in a, in a cultural ceremony. Um, and, and just asking questions. Um, I've been fortunate to um, acquire a travel company in Tahiti that I represent up here and work with them. And we've been working through uh, the changing regulations every day about how you now need a different type of test uh, to travel and you need a different type of test to travel home and jumping through all of those hoops. Uh, but what I've been able to see through the Pacific is that they understand the importance of tourism, both economically, but also in terms of how it is a human conversation, how it's the sharing of ideas between people and really investing in that tourism infrastructure. You know, it takes a lot to set up a testing station at the airport uh, in a week, yes. but, but they're doing it. They are doing everything that they can to help uh, facilitate visitors in a safe uh, way in this world that we're living in. So yeah, a lot of change, a lot of silver linings, but a lot of hard work at the same time. Yeah, yeah, but it's nice to see it pay off, right? On the on the end and if somebody would have asked you two years ago if you thought you'd be at this place and, and it's such a good place uh, you might not have said you would have said maybe down the road right so that, that's a good thing exactly. and Sarah you know you've had some some time to explore some other cool things exactly well um a couple of things you've said there Ren just also I mean you're right, travel economically, tourism is of huge benefit, but that's sort of the outcome because what you've actually seen here when all of that money has gone away, you've actually gone and focused on the very essence of it, which is the storytelling because without tourism, as a, as a people, we're just, we're pretty one dimensional. We've got to, you know, exploring new cultures and hearing their stories is why you actually fundamentally travel um, and it moves you. And so the fact that that results in an economic benefit to a country really is secondary to what you're enriching in a person's life. And so whilst that's always been a focus, um, it's um, part, definitely part of the future and that's really important. And one of our pivots since we've got onto that dreadful word um, was going into um, storytelling of a different nature, which is um, film production, television production, which is something I never uh, had any experience in before and didn't really see that as my journey. But it was a conversation with one of the local general managers of Richard Rooney, who you know, Jolene of Morikoho. Mm. And he just said, I wish we could get more New Zealanders to, to see what it's like inside these lodges, because I think they just think we're all, you know, just rich people who just have it easy here. And it's just, but they don't realize this is actually our livelihoods. This is our lifeblood and it's our story. And that's um, really important to us. And I'd love more of them to be able to come in through the door. So uh, my sister happens to run a um, television production company, which certainly helps. And um, we just, I the, a few conversations with her and we explored how can we allow armchair aspirational travel, which is where it's really at at the moment, um, into more people's lives. And so, and it's, um, we've created a, series called The Lap of Luxury, which goes on air next week in New Zealand. Um, and it's 10 episodes. It's actually extended into Australia as well, Drew. So we have 
Australasian um, properties and it's going to, it's about the stories of the people who work at these places. So it's not about the thread count or the cost of it and the who's who of who stayed at these places. It's actually about the Kiwis, New Zealanders and the Aussies who work at these beautiful places um, and it's their stories and it's really, it's beautiful. So yeah, it's a lovely series. The gardener, the cook, the chef. Exactly. Or, uh, the, the farmer. Yeah. 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 Um, I yeah, love so, that. Yeah, it's a really rich story. And um, so, so hopefully... Many people. It's not just, you know, we, we tend to stay in these lodges and we, we may interact mostly with the front of house staff, the you know, the person at the front desk or the concierge or the person that's serving us breakfast in the morning. But there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that you never get to know those faces and those stories. Um, and it's so important because this has really impacted each and every single one of those people. And, and you're right. I mean, travel is, a, I, I say, first and foremost, it's a privilege. It's not a right. Mm -hmm. And we need to utilize it for, for the good. And when it was all taken away, it affected, it affected everybody. But those are the people that really, I think, were affected the most. You know? And the communities in yeah. which those places are and like those people. Uh, the impact there is is right through that community, and it could be the local farmer who supplies that property in a region um, with the eggs, <laughs> as simple as that. And suddenly, uh, you, yeah, so the, the impact has been really far-reaching, and so doing anything we can to help those communities, I think, uh, get through this time by maybe touching on stories and, and, and other ways is going to be really helpful for the, for the reset and the return. I, I agree. So it's very chilly here. Um, we're expecting to get hit by a, a major snowstorm starting tonight and tomorrow. So Ren, the Pacific Islands, my gosh, I think we, if we could be anywhere right now, probably all of us would like to be sitting on some sandy beach with our toes in the sand and a, and a nice cocktail with an umbrella. Um, but they're also, they're, they're beautiful, they're remote, they're exotic, and they hold a place on most travelers' wish lists that's pretty high. Um, for a lot of Americans, there might be some destinations within Oceania that aren't as familiar as others, but maybe should be on our radar. And I'd love to hear about some of those places from you. Sure. Well, the, the beautiful thing about the Pacific is it's right on the doorstep of the West Coast. So if you're on the West Coast, it's very, very accessible for you. So, you know, Tahiti is only an eight hour flight um, and it's on the same time zone as Hawaii. So in terms of accessibility, we're all used to going to Hawaii, uh, Tahiti, Fiji, they're all in the same kind of neighborhood in terms of travel distance and travel time. So sort of harking back a little bit to that conversation that we opened with about domestic tourists and seeing your own backyard and going deeper and looking for richer experiences, um, you know, there are destinations within existing destinations. So what I mean by that is Tahiti has over a hundred different islands and there's four main islands that we go to. Generally, we hop across. What about the other 96 islands? Um, those islands are just as beautiful, have just a, an interesting story to tell. But we just don't seem to visit them. And it, again, it goes back to what Drew's point about expectations and maybe not having air conditioning in the room or something like that. But there are very beautiful, rich stories if you just look deep enough. Uh, you know, the Marquesas, for example, in Tahiti is one of the most remote island groups in the world. It's the furthest from any part, you know, any mainland uh, that you'll find in the entire world. Uh, and yet, you know, you think about the people of the Marquesas, recent studies have shown that their DNA is connected with the people of South America. Uh, you know, and so there's just, 
that's just one tiny example. Yeah. Um, but but that's an, ex an existing destination with a lot of tourism infrastructure that's really easy to get to. Um, then you have the likes of the Cook Islands, which has been quite popular, you know, gaining popularity in this market. Um, they used to have a, one, a once a week flight from LA down to Rarotonga. Uh, unfortunately, that's not happening right now, but it, it is another destination that has um, gained a lot of popularity. It, it's somewhere where there's no chain restaurants. There's no McDonald's or Wendy's or anything like that. Every shop is owned by a mom and pop. Oh, I love it. And uh, it's that kind of thing where you really get under the skin of the destination. So the Cook Islands, uh, you know, Tahiti, the, the different islands of Tahiti, then you've got uh, Vanuatu with their own interesting story. Uh, what, we, what we have to understand is that I could, I could talk about this for a whole hour because <laughs> the Pacific really... Well, I think it's planting the seeds, right? That it doesn't have to just be uh, Bora Bora and you know, Papiete, Bora Bora, these, which are lovely and wonderful and should be visited, but you can go beyond that. You can dive deeper and very much like, like all of you have said, there's a way of doing it where you can combine and, and weave this tapestry of an itinerary where you are able to ex experience what true luxury is and that's and that is the whole um, culture. So, Absolutely. all right. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. Was oh, I was just gonna tap on that too, also with Fiji, um, yeah. Ren, cause that's so true there too with, um, and it has really evolved in the last 10 years um, as a destination, becoming a little more like French Polynesia, a destination in its own right, because where it used to always be a little add on to New Zealand or Australia, um, we're seeing more demand for it as a, a destination on its own. And um, what's beautiful there is the islands are so different and um, because they employ 50% from the local village for each island resort, um, they've got their own little personalities and that you can really match the right traveler to the right, not just the resort, but that resort has a personality that comes distinctly from that local village that's on the island um, because so many of them work at that resort, which I think is just also nice, yeah. And, it's, and, and the culture, the Fijian culture is very different than the, the Polynesian, the French Polynesians uh, culture for sure. And so it's a completely different completely. experience um, as all those different little island nations are. You know, so Nathan Cripps, who's part of the Your Travel Designer team, he has a saying, he always says that the flight to um, Australia or New Zealand is two movies, a meal and a sleep which I think sums it up pretty good. Yep. Um, for many, the lands down under feel like this whole different world, a whole world away. You know, it's Southern hemisphere. So of course the climates are all reversed and everything like that. And, and a lot of people I think, think that going to Australia or going to New Zealand is a, like a once in a lifetime uh, journey. But what we find is you create an itinerary and you send these people there and then the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, wow, now we want to come back. There's so many places I didn't get to go and, and things that I didn't get to see. So with that being said, unfortunately, we know and Amer most Americans are limited to just, you know, two weeks of travel at a given time. What would be some key favorite places to include on that perfect first visit to Australia and New Zealand or, you know, New Zealand, because a lot of people think you can do both at once. And of course you can't. And then what are some of your favorite places to include um, on that in, in, inevitable return trip? Um, so maybe Sarah, you can start this off for us. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> Yeah, and one of my pet peeves is sort of um, 
sample itinerary a really um, no and I don't want to do that. no so we don't we don't <laughs> really <laughs> actually have no you're right we don't really like a typical itinerary as such but that being said um, one of the things that's so unique about New Zealand is its diversity of landscapes we actually have every geographical formation that can be found globally, um, including technically a desert, uh, but really, you know, canyons, fjords, glaciers, mountains, lakes, rivers, beaches, you name it. Um, in a country that's the size of California, so we really say it's like the world in one little California-sized bite piece of land. Uh, so what we would always try to do in that first trip is making sure they get as much of that diversity of landscape woven into the trip um, as possible. So it might be a little bit more sound bite-ish, but you're trying to just get them to see that spread, which is kind of easy because it's a small destination. So you can feel like you're not traveling endlessly to experience that. Um, and so it's really getting that mix of taste so that visually yeah. it's extremely it's impressive. Because what they might experience at the top, the Bay of Islands, that whole area is completely different from the tip. Exactly, from oh, and to the yeah, south. From a climate, yeah. from a topography. And a lot of times people will say, oh, well, I, you know, should I focus on the North Island? Should I focus on the South Island? And we always say, no, 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 you have to do both. Drew, um, again, yeah. we don't, we don't ever like to, you know, give out sample itineraries either. But I mean, if you were to say, if somebody were to say, you know, oh, um, I have 10 days or two weeks, I want to come to Australia. And, you know, when I came, I, I didn't even go to Sydney. And I would have to say, I, and I would never say this to people who are from Sydney or live in Sydney. I didn't feel like I missed out because I know now I'm going to go back. And I'll have that experience again. But the itinerary that we did with you was yeah. the southern part of the country in Tasmania was incredible. So anyways. Yeah, look, um, it's a very big thing. You know, like when I first started the company, I think about 23 years ago, one of the things I could see that people didn't see a kangaroo, right? So I created this matrix for the first time traveler. And I said, okay, these are the four things you need because one thing is everybody wants to do too much, right? Like they want to cram everything in, okay? And, and that would just make your holiday horrible because you're totally traveling all the time and you can't enjoy where you are. So I always say you really need to do three nights minimum, like absolutely minimum, unless it's Uluru where you can get away with two for sure. But um, I say for the first time traveller, there's, there's four things you need to do. Sydney, wildlife, outback, and the Great Barrier Reef. Now, depending on your personality, we will customise that around what you like. For example, on the Great Barrier Reef, there's like a private island called Haggerston, right? So if you're after adventure, you're after... Um, you know, like, you know, exploration, you can go there. Well, you know, not far from Haggerston is a place called Rain Island with uh, the largest green turtle rookery in the world, right? Like, absolutely amazing. Or if you want lux, you go to Lizard, right? So, you know, you, you're sitting at the jewel of the Great Barrier Reef, you know, you, you're within 20 minutes of the Outer Barrier Reef. So they're the four things that, that we try and put in, but we always try and put in what we call one outlier. So something that they wouldn't expect, you know, you know, like the things we were talking about before, where it's not about the thread count, it's not about the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the over the top luxury. What it's about is personality, people to people experiences and in depth. I mean, when we started the company, everybody literally had to be a owner operator, right? Because owner operators give of themselves, right? Like they will take you deeper. If you're in an outback sheep station, I mean, you would have seen this to a degree at Arkabar, Jolly, right? But you can discover so much more, right? Because 
you know, in fact, it was funny. The pl first place I convinced to get into tourism 23 years ago was Akabar because I went to boarding school with Matty Rashid, so who were the original owners. So, but yeah, look, they're the kind of things. But uh, we've always tried to include something quirky. And the funny thing is, you'll get on the lodges, you'll get a paragraph how great they were, but you get a page and a half on that person to person experience. Yeah. I agree, Ju. The person-to-person -person stuff's really important, and I would encourage everyone listening to make sure you include a, some kind of cultural experience uh, in your stay, whether that be in Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti, Fiji, or the rest of the Pacific. Um, and just just take a deep breath and remember that we're not that far away anymore. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime trip. We're going to always be there. There's always more time to come back and see. Yeah. Well, Ren, that's In fact, Ren, that's a good point. I mean, I always find it so easy. You get on the plane in LAX, you get on at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, you have a late dinner, and you wake up and you're in Sydney. Yeah, no, it is. Accommodation. Same with the going to New Zealand. I mean, the, the two movies, the meal and asleep, it's a good, it's a good description. And Ren, your point is, is so well taken because I think sometimes you know, people, they're hesitant or they have trepidation about, you know, cultural experiences because they don't want them to be contrived. They don't, they don't want to, you know, I, I hear this a lot when we're doing trips to Africa and it's like, well, you know, I don't want to go to a village and feel like, you know, these people are being taught out to perform for me. And, you know, we're very sensitive to that and I would never do anything like that, but you, there are ways, and again, I think it's, you know, working with somebody like yourself to help educate, well, you know, there's a lot of um, tradition that is still going on in these villages and in these communities, and you're blessed to be able to experience it and, um, be, and partake. For it. sure. It's not a museum. You know, we all feel a little bit more comfortable going to a museum because it's behind glass and uh, you, you think you, can, you haven't got anybody to ask a silly question. But what is just a fact for the whole of the Oceania region, South Pacific region, is that we're very friendly people. And uh, if you're friendly back, we're going to treat you with respect. And that's all it is, is that we're all part of this human story and it's just asking questions about hey is this okay am I am I allowed to do this right right asking questions a lot you know about their history you know I I just well I'm a question asker I'm probably you know one of those annoying people that ask too many questions but you know that's how I learn and that's how I suck it up and that's how I come back and those memories are are the most it's as much as I love an amazing resort with an you know 500 thread count sheets it's those people to people experiences you know that that, that that stay with you those are the experiences that stay with you because let's be real there are beautiful places all over this you won't find the friendly people that we have down in our part of the world <laughs> that is true that's true um, so let's see, I'm, gosh, I've skipped around a bit now. All right. Um, so we always try to encourage, of course, our clients, um, to not just travel in peak season. I mean, shoulder seasons are amazing time to travel as well. And there's a lot of inherent value in traveling in, in, you know, not just the busiest and most popular times of the year. For some, there might be a special event that they're really keen on participating in. Like right now, of course, um, Drew, there's the Australian Open going on in, in Melbourne. And for some, that's a bucket list thing and that's the time that they wanna go. Um, in Auckland right now, you've got the Ameris, America's Cup. And for people that are have always wanted to see that, that this would be the time that you would wanna be there. Um, but I'd like to know, a little bit about maybe some unknown but equally unmissable experiences that people can um, either partake in or um, 
that just can be had in general to, if they go in these shoulder times. Um, so maybe Drew, you want to start off on this. Okay. I mean, I've got a few here, but you know, I mean, it's also about season and best time of the year. For example, the best two months of the year on the Great Barrier Reef are April and November. Well, it's really, really warm and all the trade winds drop out and it's like glass. You know, like you've got incredible visibility. Also in November, they can time it literally to within a day or two, there's the coral spawning, which is one of the, oh, wow. you know, like, so the whole Great Barrier Reef spawns at the same time in mid-November, right? They, they actually have it on Nat Geo and things like that. So you can actually be there for the coral spawning. So that that's pretty amazing. I mean, you have one of the biggest whale migrations that comes up the Lewin Current up the southern coast of Australia. And um, there's a, like literally hundreds of southern right whales come along the Great, um, great Australian Bight because it, this current comes along the edge of the coast and it's about three to four degrees warmer. And um, the, the, the whales migrate up there and give birth to their young. So, you know, I mean, that's an absolutely fantastic time of the year. And what time of year is that? It's like sort of May, June, July. Yeah, so completely off season, but it, that's a, not a bad time to come down to. Oh, and it's perfect, perfect. Yeah. You know, I mean, the other thing is that you have, if you're into fishing at all, you know, on the Great Barrier Reef in October, you know, it's the best place on the planet to catch a giant marlin, you know, like, um, you know, they catch more in October off of Lizard Island than they do in the rest of the world combined. But it's all catch and release, of course, you know. Yes. You know, the runoff in April in the top end, you know, Darwin, Kakadu, Arnhem Land. I mean, that's just spectacular. I mean, who made this, I will use the word S-H-I-T, that you shouldn't go to the Northern Territory in the wet. I mean, yes, it's going to rain, but it's most spectacular thunderstorms you have ever seen. Yeah. I mean, bird life is just incredible. I mean, the place looks like the Garden of Eden. There's waterfalls everywhere. There's crocodiles. There's magpie geese. There's, you know, whistling ducks. There's vertican ducks. I mean, it just, you couldn't believe that there'd be more bird life. So, I mean, obviously, one, that if you're coming in normal season, everybody wants to come to Sydney on New Year's Eve. But, um, I mean, I could go on Maybe for Maybe not any more. <laughs> no, no, there are too many people. <laughs> <laughs> and not in the new world. Uh, and, and Sarah, like, what would you say, you know, these uh, unusual experiences, yeah. but not in the peak season? Well, ironically, that's when we often bring travel advisors down okay. to New Zealand off peak season. I always go around the country at that time of the year, although I've been traveling around a bit more in the summer. And I have to say the most beautiful time is off peak. But it's in particular in New Zealand, the shoulder seasons, it's absolutely rich and gorgeous. And to your point, Drew, you will see some things that you just actually have to be here for that time of the year. And wildlife is one of those very um you know the, set your clock to their their rhythm and you'll come down at the right time of the year mm. and you will be the only person and um one of those is the seal colonies and you have to be here really april into may which is our uh, fall and you can go and see these colonies where uh, the, you know the, the seals are out fishing and the the pups are still at their juvenile state so they're not at all ter you know scared of people and you can never get up as close as you can during this time and they will come right up so curious to your face it is such a rich wildlife um, experience but you've got to be here at the right time once they're you know a little bit bigger they're too savvy and they'll be offshore and then you shouldn't be near them. But at this one little point in time, um, you can be here for those months. And and equally, our spring, um, 
you've got New Zealand where, yes, you'll get rain, Drew, just like you, but it's snow-capped, it's lush green, uh, there's la little lambs everywhere, and the gardens are in full bloom, and it's just yeah. visually striking. And maybe you put on an extra jacket, but um, it's about as tough as it gets at that time of the year. Yeah, and can I add that we, we talk about the seasons here in America, North America, um, as being these drastic things, and they are. New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific is very temperate, it's very mild. So, okay, it's winter technically down there. It's not Chicago winter by any, any standard. Mm -hmm. So just remember that uh, the temperature is a lot milder down there. And you know what? Um, Tahiti only has two seasons, a dry season and a wet season. Uh, but you can enjoy your overwater bungalow just as much in the rain as you can in the sunshine. And uh, you've got some beautiful accommodations throughout the region that, you know, if you're forced to, to rug up and watch a movie with uh, breakfast in bed, it's not that bad. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was had the amazing good fortune to stay at the Brando um, in uh, French Polynesia, one of the, a small little island, not one of the four. Um, and, we got hit by the tail end of a cyclone um, and it disrupted things. I mean, it wasn't bad, We, but you know, so what? We had something to kind of keep us semi dry. We went and explored the jungle one day. We did a cocktail making class. We made the most of the, the kind of not beach time. And then when the sun came out, it was like, you should have seen the six of us that were on this fam. It was like, we'd never seen sun before, right? <laughs> we're like, we're gonna make every minute of it. Everybody get down to the beach. And it, it, but it was, it was, I would go that. And that was January, I yep. think, January, February, this time of year. And it can just be that way. I mean, you don't- Still, go still gorgeous and warm. I'm sure yeah. you were still warm. I, I have pictures of me paddle boarding and in the water and everything I won't share, but you know, still. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, there's some big misconceptions out there. I mean, you know, like people think you can only come over, over, um, you know, festive. And I, I, I would say spend festive at home with your family and come at these off peak times when you can get all the best guides all the best experiences, you know, like, I mean, I know I talked about a post-COVID traveler before, but I really, really think, you know, and I and I, I was very glad to hear you say it too, Jolene, that, you know, I want to deal with our kind of people, right, that are really into discovery, you know, um, getting off the beaten track, you know, I just don't want it to be a treadmill anymore. No, I, I, I would agree with that um, wholeheartedly. So we have come to, we have a few minutes left and there have been some questions that come in. So we're not gonna get to all my millions of questions, unfortunately, but um, I wanna get to some client questions. So um, uh, someone wrote, Sarah, these small group package tours, is this something you're considering continuing beyond the border closure? It'd be so fun to travel with some Kiwis or some in some lesser, to some lesser known places in New Zealand. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, yes, at the moment we're, we're launching this to the domestic traveler, but our intention is uh, they've been so well received that we will keep up the explorations um, as, um, you know, it's a separate company, um, but it's all through Southern Crossings and we will continue that because I think uh, it's, it's been really lovely and it does, it's part of our mindful reset is to get into those communities that are just like you say, um, and in a really nice way with, with a New Zealand guide and host. Yeah, no, I think that's great. You know, there's one question I can't miss because it's really important to me. And if we go over just a teeny. Um, so if anyone out there has been listening to these, the past four um, conversations, everybody knows that sustainability, conservation and community is super important to me. Um, and so I'd love to hear, we've talked a lot about that, which I'm 
thrilled, but I'd love to know, have you seen, you know, your partners um, doing anything in these, in this regard, any initiatives that our clients can either participate in while they're there, community projects or conservation projects or support um, so, cause sometimes people are like, I don't have time. I want to do it or, you know, whatever their reasons are, but they still want to be supportive of those endeavors. So, um, Ren, I'm going to have you go first on this. So, um, one thing about border closures is that yes, we're cutting off the flow of people, but, uh, we're also stopping, uh, people from going to school and all of that sort of thing. So one thing that we've been doing, uh, is with Pacific Storytelling is we're in the beginning phases of starting a foundation to uh, raise money to help provide internet in hard to reach areas, mm -hmm. um, specifically for uh, children who can't go to school because of COVID lockdowns or closures or anything like that. So it, this is one of those um, things that are in the early stages for us, uh, but it, it's initiatives like that that we're seeing on the ground. People are pulling together. Um, I talked to you earlier, Jolene, about the wider Pacific um, feeling. You know, as a part of my storytelling, I've been interviewing uh, different cultural uh, icons throughout the Pacific and talking to them about the COVID experience. Um, and one in particular stands out to me, which is the experience of Hawaii reopened in August. Um, and something that was really obvious to me was that no one was asking the local people how they felt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something that I picked up and ran with and I asked them questions and they said, yes, uh, we've had to band together as local communities and go back to the old way of doing things where you grow this type of vegetable, this other person grows some other type of vegetable. We have a fisherman and a, and a farmer and we all start to trade again. And so it's, it's going back to the basics of just looking after your neighbor. Right. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that we're starting to see more and more. And I think it's going to stick around um, is that people helping people uh, is something that I think is, is here to stay. And, and that translates to the visitor experience as well, because when we go down, these types of programs will still be in place and we'll be able to chip in, help out, contribute uh, to these types of initiatives as well. And I think it's it, it's going to be um, a good thing for us as tourism operators because it helps show that we actually do care for our local communities uh, and we do want to give back right. as well. And it's part of the, uh, an authentic experience, right? Exactly, so. exactly. Living like a, how the local people do uh, in a scene. Right. Um, Drew and Sarah? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, you go. No, you go. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I mean, yeah, really to your point, I mean, it's working closely with the Department of Conservation um, here. Um, I was lucky enough to spend some time um, on the uh, christening the Hollyford track that had been affected by some floods at the in February last year and worked um, hiked it with the, the head of the Department of Conservation and uh, we're working on some projects similar to you uh, being, um, for children as well so that they can actually see and if, if they end up in a lockdown situation again and working from home that their schools can be taught. We're partnering with um, some people in Australia for that but um, also um, looking at ways that you can actually have an immersive experience when you come back. We've done it for clients in the past but we're wanting to get more into this. We've had um, uh, a child who was here for wildlife and conservation, very ambitious 13 year old. And he went setting traps with a, a ranger and with the dog who does help, help sniff out all the, um, the species that were here that shouldn't really be in New Zealand, um, all the mammals. Non-indigenous non species. So protecting our bird life, which is so uh, mainly because they can't fly, they didn't need to. So just looking at those, not just in a um, hearing about it and knowing about it, but actually in a really immersive experience with it. That's great. Drew? 
So, I mean, we've, we've been, we've really strengthened our relationship with national parks and it's given us like unrivaled access mm. to a lot of um, places that normally no people can get. But one of the biggest things we've done is we've teamed up with um, Australia's largest pro um, private non-for-profit wildlife conservancy. And so, you know, there, for example, in the Kimberley, there's a place called the Artesian Range. And, um, you know, it's like a Noah's Ark because there's cliffs and everything all around it. It's been completely untouched. And we have set up a deal with them so that we can get access to that area and bring people who can potentially be large donors to that. And we can get an extremely private experience. Like I know nobody else can offer that experience, you know? So, you know, it's been about, you know, really stretching the imagination, but I've got one that I've always loved and I've loved it for, 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 you know, over 20 years. There's a place in Australia called the Botanical Ark, which is the largest collection of ethnobotanical plants in the world. So, but ethnobotanical plants are plants used by humans from the rainforest, right? And this, you know, the seed bank they have in the Arctic, you know, so if there was an apocalyptic event, they can recreate the earth. He has basically done that on this farm in North Queensland. He's been to over 120 rainforests around the world over the last 40 years and has had has the largest collection of food, medicinal, and plants by, used by humans in um, the rainforest on the planet. And I mean, the guy is the David Attenborough of plants. It is just inspiring. And I mean, we try and send everybody there and support him as much as we can. I mean, like, yeah, he's, he's like a hero to me. I love him. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, we're gonna take one last question. We're gonna end on a fun note. Um, somebody has asked that they would like to know the single favorite experience for each of you. <laughs> Is that like picking a child? Yeah, I was gonna say, you can't choose a child, can you? Or maybe you can say it to your wife. Oh, I don't know. It's tough, but I'll, Drew, you can go first. Uh, tell us if you could, if somebody were to say tomorrow, after tomorrow, tomorrow's the last day in the world, what, and you can do one really amazing, fun or not amazing experience, what would that be? Oh, this is hard. It's going to be somewhere really remote, I can tell you that. Probably Arnhem Land. I think Arnhem Land is just amazing. Where is that? So next to Kakadu off of Darwin, there's an Aboriginal, you know, territory there. And it's about, you know, putting in perspective, Kakadu is the third largest national park in the world. And Arnhem Land is about six times the size with under like 5,000 people living in it, right? So it is completely and utterly untouched. I mean, they've been trading with the Macassans for thousands of years. Anyway, there's a place out there, an Aboriginal reserve that one of the family groups own, and it's like got over three and a half million acres that literally has nobody there. I think I'd go there. Yeah. The Americans, they don't understand how vast Australia is with these huge chunks of land that literally have not a lot of population. So. I mean, to give you an idea, an Aboriginal family was discovered in the great sandy desert in like 1998 i mean 1988 and they didn't even realize that the europeans had come to australia good for them no i'm just kidding <laughs> i mean but don't you find that incredible i do like yeah, I like the, some of the people in the amazon but you don't expect that in australia yeah totally. well, yeah Australia's probably got more wilderness than the Amazon even, you know? Yeah, yeah, true. And um, Sarah, what would be your, what's your favorite experience? Well, I mean, this is, I mean, this is something we do share with a lot of our, our visitors, but um, 
New Zealand is particularly unique when when viewed from a helicopter. There's just no getting away from it. It is an extraordinary way. And we do get accused of, but we're planting trees as well, don't worry. Um, but we get accused of putting um, everyone in one, but it is for a very good reason. And even if it's just a little 15 minute hop ran over where um, you grew up in um, Rotorua, it's or, but my favorite would have to be um, landing on an untouched glacier in the Southern Alps, uh, just pristine environment. You feel like you're on top of the world. And when you shut down the helicopter and that sound of silence, and you can see the coast on one side, you can see lakes and rivers on the other, and you're standing on a, a glacier that is not one of the well-known trodden ones, but just a little pocket um, that is ice year round. I mean, that's precious. And we know how precious that is because we need to keep these for the future. Yeah, it's true. There is, it's something so special. And if those pilots are so adept at getting you just at that right moment when the sun is just perfectly going down and you feel like there's nobody else on earth, but you. You, exactly. Ren? Well, you're going to get me in trouble, Jolene, because uh, it should be a cultural experience. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, so there's a, there is a, two islands in this one lagoon. There's an island called Raiatea in Tahiti, which is the cradle of civilization where all Polynesian cultures come from. The most sacred temple of Polynesia is there. Wow. Very important, very important. However, it's not my one thing to do. <laughs> Next door to that is another island called Taha'a, which is the home of the Tahitian vanilla. And uh, this island, you can do a half day tour around it by jet ski. And your first stop, you have three stops. Your first stop is to a pearl farm owned by a local family. And you learn all about how they create the beautiful, famous black Tahitian pearls. Your next stop is to a vanilla plantation and you see them massaging the pods by hand and laying them out in the sun. Uh, and then your final stop on your tour is to the rum distillery. And so, you know, pearls, rum, and vanilla, it feels like you're, uh, it's a very good day. <laughs> Beautiful combination. I think that's the winner. That's a yeah. good way to end. We'll end with pearls, rum, uh, vanilla, and rum. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This was so much fun. I really appreciate your time and your, just your incredible wisdom and knowledge that you share with me and with our clients and your smiling faces and it is snowing out my window now so I'm happy to know that you're all in the sunshine even Ren is probably down in Southern California in the sunshine so I will I will gather that warmth and keep it with me for the rest of the day so thank all of you so much thanks, thanks for listening yeah. yeah we hope to see you soon cheers thanks bye bye, <laughs> bye, -bye. bye, -bye.